Well, thanks to all who are joining us today, and I hope this turns out to be an interesting seminar. It certainly will be a nice experience for me to hear questions from the folks who are listening in. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some of the work that we do at the Rudd Center at Yale. And the slide here shows not only our logo, but our website. And I always like to bring the website to the attention of people because it's really, we're very proud of it. And it's a wonderful website, rich with information on food and food policy issues. So if you care to go there, hopefully you'll find the information helpful. And there are specific things in there about a variety of the issues that I'll be discussing today. But in addition, we send out a free email newsletter with alerts about things that are happening in the field. Uh, breaking issues, and we also have a series of podcasts that we've recorded, a long series of podcasts with people who have visited the Rudd Center, um, who are ranged from economists and politicians uh, to scholars uh, to people from the media and also well-known food writers such as Mark Bittman and Michael Pollan and people of that ilk. Um, I'm going to begin today with a conceptual scheme to share that we use, and it, it it's been very helpful in guiding our own work in thinking through how do you address issues such as obesity and even malnutrition at the level of the population. Now, I don't know how many people on the call are, have training in psychology, psychiatry, medicine, or the health professions, but most of us are trained to think a certain way, uh, and we use traditional medical models. And those are helpful to some extent in dealing with the problem, but haven't really gotten us to the goal of reducing prevalence at the population level. So we're hoping to think about things in a different way. If you think about the way our country uh, deals with uh, issues where health behaviors are related to health outcomes, so that would include smoking, uh, drinking, sexual behavior, eating for sure, um, we generally begin focusing on the individual and hope that we can apply something to the individual and there will be a better outcome. So we default to giving people knowledge or information or education, and we hope we can implore them or motivate them somehow in order to create change. So we generally educate and implore. If you think back to the early days of tobacco, early days of alcohol control, uh, early days of AIDS and things like that, that's generally what you find. And it certainly has been true in the nation's attempt to deal with the obesity problem. Now, in the case of obesity in particular, you can medicate and operate. And you hope that some combination of these things leads to less of the problem. But by any, anybody's um, metric, this has been a failed experiment. We've been doing this now as a nation for 30 or 40 years. While we've known very well that prevalence rates are really high, and the prevalence rates have just skyrocketed out of control. Um, and, but it basically relies on this model that if you give people education or knowledge, and that could come through TV programs, it could come through uh, interactions with uh, health professionals, therapists, and the like, could come through brochures, books, and the like. But it's what it is is knowledge overall. Our hope is that knowledge will lead to changes in behavior. There's an interesting uh, body of research that would make you wonder whether this is a fruitful model or not. So behind these orange boxes are, is a graph that will show the percentage of people in the U.S. population who get recommended levels of physical activity. And this was done from 1986 to 2000. And during that time, um, there was a lot of it, new information on physical activity, a, a vast body of research, Surgeon General's reports, recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control, American College of Sports Medicine, and the like. So there really can't be many Americans who don't realize it's a good idea to be active. But if you look at the rates of the, the percentage of people becoming or being active, you get numbers that look like this. And there are two things that are striking about this. One is that the line is flat, so all the increasing knowledge hasn't done very much. And then also the numbers are low, which is quite discouraging given that most people know that it's a good idea to exercise. Maybe we're doing better with diet. So this is the percentage of adults getting the recommended fruit and vegetable servings in their day-to-day -day life. And you see the numbers look pretty similar. Uh, you might hope we're doing better with our children. So this is a percentage of U.S. children getting recommended fruit and vegetable servings. And the numbers look like this. So you show a graph slide after slide that would support this point that just education alone is not getting the job done. So unfortunately, that's pretty much what we're doing as a nation with some notable exceptions happening now. 
Um, but this, again, by any standard, has been a failed experiment. So can we really wipe the slate clean and start with a new conceptual model for addressing this problem? Um, and instead of focusing on the individual, could it be possible to focus on the conditions that affect the individual or lead to the individual making the decision in hopes that you'll end up with healthier behavior? So can you change the environment in important ways? Can you change economics? Can you use legislation? Can you use the regulatory authority of government to create, and this is a term that I borrowed from economists, optimal defaults? Well, the concept here is that the default environment that we're exposed to affects our behavior. And you may be better off changing the environment rather than just focusing on the individual. So an example would be clean water. Now, we could allow the water to be polluted and then teach people uh, pollution remediation techniques, put pills in the water, boil it, et cetera. Um, and, but it would be a public health nightmare if you did that, and the public would be very, uh, very uh, opposed to government taking that kind of action. So we create better defaults. So when we drink public drinking water, we know it's going to be safe for the most part, and that creates a good water default. And the question is, are there food-related examples of this? And uh, there obviously are. And I'll come back to some of those in a minute. Um, government has had a long history of, of taking action like this, and the public supports it in the health arena. So the question is, can we create defaults that are better, and that might lead to better behavior? Well, here is, are several examples of how powerful defaults are. Um, this is information from economists at Harvard who have studied enrollment and pension plans. So what, we're not talking about health at all, but just an economic example. When people get a job, employers often uh, offer enrollment in a pension plan, but do it in one of two ways. One way is that the employee has to take the active step of enrolling because of the default is to not be in the plan. The reverse of that is that the individual is enrolled by default in the pension plan, but has the option of opting out. So people in both of these circumstances have the same choice. They can freely be in or out of the pension plan, but whether people enroll um, is, is affected a lot by what the default is. So if the default is not to be in the plan and you have to make the active step of joining the plan, you get about 50% enrollment. If you change the default, you double that to nearly 100%. Now, <clears throat> most people would consider enrollment in, pen in pension plans a social good because individuals are not uh, dependent on the state later in life because they've invested more wisely as they go along. <coughs> and so if that's true, there's clearly a suboptimal and clearly an optimal default here without really affecting the choices that the, the individual has. And you could try to educate your way from 50 to 100%, and you'd never get anywhere near there, or you can simply change the default. Here's another example, one of the most striking that I've ever seen, is people, enroll, people agreeing to be organ donors, in this case in European countries. So to the left of the white vertical line there that you see between the two orange boxes, there are four countries, Denmark, Netherlands, the UK, and Germany, that use the US model for being an organ donor, where you're not an organ donor by default, but you can agree to be one when you get your driver's license. And you can probably anticipate what's coming to the right of that line, countries that do the reverse, where you are an organ donor by default, but you can opt out. So again, the individuals have the same choices. It's just that the default changes. And using the US model, here are the percentage of people who agree to be organ donors. If you change the default, you get numbers that look like this. Now, those I don't know that there's any way to describe those differences other than breathtaking. Um, you can't imagine with any amount of money or government persuasion or anything else that could be done to get organ donation rates as high as they are in those the countries to the right of the graph. Or you can do something that would cost nothing and can be implemented immediately You change the default. So again, back to the, the diet nutrition area, are there negative defaults or positive defaults? Well, there are plenty of negative ones to be sure, and most of us would, would note this as we look around our environment. When I was a boy, uh, Coke or Pepsi came in a six and a half or eight ounce bottle. And when you had, had a soft drink, you had one and then the event was over and you didn't have another one for a long time in all likelihood. But now the portion sizes can be multiples of that. I think the default is a 20 ounce bottle now. 
and people tend to consume whatever is in a bag or a bottle or a box, a phenomenon called unit bias. And when this occurs, the consumption of beverage calories goes way up. So portions are an example of a negative default. And not only soft drinks fall into this category, but the size of hamburgers, the size of muffins, orders of french fries and the like. Everything has gotten to be much bigger than it used to be. Uh, the economics of food are just about the reverse of what you'd like if you were setting up a, a new society. Uh, what you'd like, presumably, are healthy foods to cost less and unhealthy foods to cost more. Um, far too much access to unhealthy foods. Again, when I was a boy, there were a few fast food restaurants here and there, but not much. There weren't vending machines everywhere. Uh, fast food restaurants weren't open 24 hours a day. Uh, gas stations didn't uh, have food for sale. Uh, drug stores didn't have much food for sale. And so things are totally different in terms of access. Uh, there's too little access to healthy food uh, for many people. Now that's beginning to change, but it's still it's still pretty pretty late to happen. And then food marketing is an example of a really terrible set of defaults because children especially are overwhelmed by marketing of unhealthy foods. And while the companies are claiming they're going to do better, it doesn't appear that they are. And as a consequence, they're a bad set of, of environmental factors that are driving poor eating. So I'd like to, to shift gears for just a moment and talk about how do we deal with this from a scientific point of view. Uh, some of you on the uh, call may be doing science in the area, like my colleagues and I are. And we try to think a lot about how we can better harness science for social change. And not, when I say science, it could be scholarship, it could be randomized studies, but it could be observational studies, it could be uh, qualitative studies, it could be legal analyses, economic analyses, and the like. But I'm talking about scholarship in general. Now, if we ask how good science is at creating social change, um, I don't know that there are many people that would say that there's a very good connection there, that we're really creating a lot of social change from science. There are some examples where that's not true, but far too often what's known in science takes years and years and years to impact the, what's going on at the level of the society, if at all. And there are some reasons for that. Uh, let's just make a hypothetical tongue-in-cheek case and, and say, let's say we were setting out to make science as irrelevant as possible to anything that's important socially. What would you do? Well, first of all, you'd make it very slow. Uh, it would take a long time to get a grant uh, to fund the research. Uh, your human subjects committee might take months to give you approval. It would take a long time after you did the study to get it reviewed by journals, and then it could take as much as a year to get it out in print once the, the study is all done and accepted for publication. Uh, you would communicate it poorly. That is, we would decide as scientists that our job was done when the paper was published in a journal, um, and we fool ourselves often into thinking more people read these things than they really do. Um, and so we tend to communicate with a relatively small number of people who care about the specific issues we care about. And we don't communicate it to the world in general, especially to the people who might take that information and make a difference with it. Uh, it would be unresponsive to real world needs, and it would only be responsive to what other scientists believe are important questions to be addressed. It would only be programmatic rather than strategic, and I'll come back and talk about that. And there would be conflicts of interest galore, that is, the affected industries would be paying scientists to do studies that favor industry's position, and that happens uh, in spades in our particular field. And so again, this is a tongue-in-cheek, let's you know, make a ridiculous argument. Uh, but in fact, all of these things are occurring, and it's making science not be so much in touch with the real world as it might be, because such good work is going on out there. And so we're, we're hoping to make the, a change and to, to create a, a more rapid response type science that can have an impact on the different things. And the way we think about it is that we want our research ultimately, and I think most people who are in the health professions overall are in this to help people, and we hope that our research will affect other researchers, and we're pretty good at that, but we're not very good at creating social and policy change. And the metaphor I use to, to describe this is a relay race where the baton gets dropped. So if you look at those two runners from the USA with those sort of horrified looks on their face, uh, what's happened is that, let's just say that the runner who was to get the baton is the anchor running the last leg of the race, and the person who ran the third leg 
uh, did his job and ran as fast as he could, and now it's time to hand baton to the other person. He's going to take it and hopefully win the race and get to the goal. Um, but if the baton gets dropped, then that, of course, doesn't occur. Now, in, when we're using science, very often what happens is we're the, one of the, the runners, and we do our leg of the race, and we publish our papers, and then, then that's it. And we feel, we hope that somebody's going to do something with it, that somebody will notice it, make use of it, that the world will somehow get better. But in, unless we take active steps to accomplish that, then the baton gets dropped, and nothing really happens, typically. And so the question is, can, can we work to create uh, science that has strategic value by making sure the baton doesn't get dropped and that we're interacting with the anchor leg, the, the fourth person in this race who might ultimately make a difference with that baton? So the way we, we think about it is that research can create social change and policy change. And you can have this world uh, where, where things are, are more helpful, where research is connecting up with it. But it happens through certain things that most of us are not trained to think about. And those are what we call change agents. So those would be people or institutions who are in a position to make a difference and to take what we find from the research we do and apply it into the real world. Um, th so legislators would obviously be important. A lot of people don't think about government regulators, but these would be individuals who work in federal agencies, like the US Department of Agriculture, the Federal Trade Commission, the Food and Drug Administration, all of whom can really do a lot within, within certain boundaries and can be very helpful. And they're state equivalents of those national agencies, typically. But uh, we don't think about them very much. Uh, the courts are going to be a, a very important player here, and they're beginning to be already. Uh, some of you have probably heard about Mayor Bloomberg's proposal through his Department of Health to limit portion sizes of sugar beverages to be sold in venues where the city has jurisdiction. Uh, it was widely expected that that would pass through the Board of Health in New York City, which it did, and then they would be sued by the, the uh, food industry, which they have been. And so the courts become terribly important here, and we can get involved with that process. Uh, changing public opinion through the press becomes a very important part of mobilizing uh, science into social change. Non-government organizations can be terribly important. Uh, these could be granting agencies, like in the, the case of obesity work that we're doing, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, advocacy organizations like the American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, and the like. And obviously, industry is an important player. So we, we try to think about who are the change agents, who are the people out there in a position to do something, and how can we help them? How can we be an ally to them? How can we support them, give them information that will be helpful in the work we do, and try to create, instead of vicious cycles of not, nothing happening, more virtuous cycles where solutions occur. And so we think about it this way, that when we think about doing strategic research, we begin by ident identifying change agents. I discussed the, who those people might be before. That helps us develop strategic questions that we can address through our scholarly work. The scholarship occurs, and then the most important thing, but the thing that we very don't often don't even think about because we're not trained to do it, is the communications part. And the communications can be with the press, it could be with the non-government organizations, it could be back to the legislators and regulators, but it's connecting up the, the science back to the change agents that really helps make a difference. So we very often talk to these change agents and find out what are, what, are their op, what are the people who oppose to the public policies they're trying to get enacted uh, will say? Um, what sort of gaps in knowledge do they feel there are that we might help address and the like? And that helps us do the strategic research. So I'd like to just give you several examples of this um, and uh, talk about food and addiction uh, as one part of this because it's a book um, that uh, Mark Gold and I edited for Oxford University Press that I think was the, the genesis of this phone call. Uh, talking about cereal as an example, there's a tremendous amount of marketing of breakfast cereals to kids. Uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation gave us a grant to study how much marketing there, there is and who's being targeted by it and what particular cereals are being marketed. And we subsequently did similar studies with uh, sugared beverages and with fast food. Uh, the serial report, which we published first in 2009, and then we did a three-year follow-up that we released not all that long ago, 
is known as serial fax. And if you'd like to get the full report or this four-page brochure that you see here that has the, the bullet points of the report, uh, you can just Google serial fax or fast food fax or sugary beverage fax, and you'll find the various reports. Now back to serial. What we did is let's say that you create a list uh, of all cereals um, that might be in the child's domain uh, according to nutrition score. And you put the worst offenders at the top of the list. Those are the ones with the least nutrition and the most, uh, the highest density of unhealthy nutrients. And then next to that, you put a list of what's marketed most aggressively to kids. It's interesting to see how those two lists overlap. If you take the best dozen cereals, that is the cereals with the, the, the most positive nutrient profiles, here's what they happen to be. And there are a few uh, common names here that you'll recognize, but a lot you won't. And one of the reasons that that's true is that if you look at all the marketing that's done on television, through internet websites, and uh, through something called adver gaming, which are games on company websites, of the best dozen cereals, it comes to exactly zero. No marketing of these at all. Well, what if you take the worst dozen cereals, the ones with the worst nutrient scores, and you get names that will begin to look more familiar. And then if we look to see how much marketing there is across all those venues, then it looks like this. And so that's really a pretty dismal picture. And it's not as if the companies want kids to be overweight. But if they did, it would be pretty hard to do a better job than this, is to take your worst products and market them most aggressively to kids. Um, what was interesting, and back to the strategic research, is when we were going to release our report, we anticipated uh, what the industry's argument would be. And it wasn't too hard to anticipate that, because I've been on panels with them in TV debates and things like that. And the industry basically makes a three-point uh, argument. They have a logic chain. And part one is that breakfast is a good thing, that eating breakfast leads to better health outcomes. And that's true. Uh, research has shown that. They will make the second argument that cereal is a good way to deliver nutrients. Uh, it's a good vehicle for delivery of nutrients, and that's also true. But the third part is that kids won't eat the cereals unless they have, they have a lot of sugar. And this is shown in a paper written by two of the nutrition leaders, one at Kellogg and one at General Mills, in a particular publication where they said this, that food doesn't become nutrition until it's eaten, so the, that means that it, you could have the best cereal in the world, but if it's sitting in the bowl and the kids won't eat it, it doesn't do anybody any good. And then they also go on to say this, um, children like the taste of ready-to-eat cereals and are therefore more likely to eat breakfast. Well, ready-to-eat here is a euphemism in their minds for high sugar cereals, and that um, the kids are only going to eat if they eat these kind of cereals. So we did a study. Um, this is a testable hypothesis. And, and we did a study to examine whether the industry's proposition was true. So we ran this was a strategic study rather than a programmatic study. There was no body of research literature out there that said this was an important question to address. We just did it because we knew what would happen when the press called when our report got released. So we did this study where we randomly assigned kids to conditions where they either got for breakfast, a low sugar version of a cereal, like cornflakes, versus a high sugar version of the same cereal, like sugar frosted flakes. And the kids could eat as much cereal as they want. They could put on as much sugar as they wanted to both versions. They could use as much milk as they wanted. And they could add fruit as, as they wished. And what we found is that the kids that got the low sugar version of the cereal got just ate just about what you'd want a child to have for breakfast. And in order to sweeten up, they put fruit on it. So they got the nutrition boost from the fruit. The kids who got the high sugar version cereal ate twice as much as what you'd like to see a child eat and put less fruit on it and therefore failed to get the nutrition boost that way. And so the companies, what we anticipated the companies were going to say was not at all true. Then it turned out that our, our projection was right, that when the press uh, got the press release about our studies, um, and they predictably called officials at these companies, and the officials went through their logic chain, with the last argument being the kids won't, won't eat these cereals if they have a lot of sugar on it. Then the press would say, but what about this study that Yale just did that showed that that's not true? And it really undermined one of the industry's chief arguments uh, that we figured they would use in response to our report. And when our report came out and this strategic study came out, which was published in a good journal in pediatrics, and here's how it looks, 
um, what we found is that the industry w was was on the defensive, um, as we hope, because they had a hard time justifying their practices of marketing their worst cereals to children. And within several months of the release of our report, the industry, General Mills announced that they were going to reduce the sugar in its children's cereals by about 25%. Uh, now, we can't take credit for that because there are a lot of people working on this other than, than us. Um, but it's interesting how that change came about because people put pressure on the industry. So back to one of our original diagrams, our research led to, to social and policy changes. The companies um, changed what they were doing, and we hope they'll make further changes. And that really occurred through the press and through the public opinion that, that the industry has to worry about, and then the changes by the industry itself. So that would be one example of, uh, of a strategic study. Now another area that I'd like to talk about is the area, oh I'd like, I'm sorry, I had a few more slides on the, uh, the cereals. Um, one of the other things we did was to hold, try to hold the industry accountable to promises it was making. It's very common for industries, and food in, the food industry is doing this predictably, uh, to ask that they not be regulated by government when they're under attack, that by saying that we can police ourselves and they issue a number of self-regulatory promises and pledges saying, for example, that we'll market less to children. Um, and then the idea is that the public or the legislators will trust them and not have to get in and regulate. Um, so when they make these kind of promises that they'll market less to kids, we want to hold them accountable. So if you look at the cereals marketed to kids, let's look to see what happened in the three years between the two reports that we did, one in 2009 and the other published this year. Um, if you look at the cereals that were marketed in 2008, and those, that was the basis for a 2009 paper, here are the top 10 cereals marketed to kids, and again, it's all the, the worst cereals. Uh, if you look at what happened uh, between then and 2011, one cereal disappeared from that list, number nine, and it got replaced with this, so hardly improvement. And then there was a little jockeying around on the list, a few things moved in different places, but it's all those same cereals being marketed most aggressively to kids. So do you trust the industry to really protect children? Well, it doesn't appear so from data like this. And again, these are strategic bits of research that we've done. Um, if you look uh, at, at this another way, you can take US uh, practices versus what's happening in other places. Uh, there's a, a UK uh, government agency called Ofcom, which is the Office of Communications, which is the UK version of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, they created pretty good advertising standards for what foods can be marketed on, to kids on television. And if you take the American cereals and see how many would be able to be, uh, be permitted to be marketed on television, if the UK standards were applied, there is exactly one cereal that would make the grade. If you look at the, the standards that the US companies have set for themselves and are applying in this self-regulatory mode they're in, what, would, what meets the standards? Well, it's these kind of cereals that meet the standards. So you can see that, that the industry is setting self-serving standards, then they, they brag about meeting them, but is it really affecting public health? And when you see things like this, you'd have to wonder. Now, another, another issue where we've done some strategic research is on the issue of food and addiction. Um, the, it's interesting to think about how food affects the brain. And more and more researchers are beginning to think that there might be some addictive process set up by some products, especially those with lots of sugar. And here's the metaphor that we use to describe this process, that what you see on the slide is the coca leaf, which in its natural form um, is not terribly reinforcing, and people can live in harmony with it. So you don't see people abusing this in its natural form. But when it gets processed and becomes cocaine, or when it gets processed even further and becomes crack cocaine, it's hyper-processed, um, then humans can no longer live in harmony with it and you have a real social problem existing. And the question is, how different is that from, say, corn, where you don't hear, ever hear of people abusing corn in its natural form. <coughs> you know, people aren't sneaking off the binge on ears of corn and things. But when you process it and it becomes something like this, then what do you get? And if you take wheat, which nobody abuses in its natural form, and you turn it into a product like this, then what happens? 
And if you take water and hyperprocess it into something like this, what happens? And you really have to wonder, uh, is, is there some biological hijacking of the brain that goes on? Um, nobody would claim that there's, it's as strong as, as it would be with crack cocaine or with heroin or morphine or something. Um, but is there enough of an addictive process that creates a public health menace? And should this be the basis for intervention in one form or another, including protecting kids from the marketing or sales of these kind of products, potentially? So we, we believe that this was a, a very interesting, fascinating topic from a, a, a um, research point of view, but also could have pretty important social implications. So we decided to look into it, and I give a special credit to a person who was a graduate student of mine until recently, Ashley Gearhart, who now is on the faculty at the University of Michigan. She took this on and did some really interesting work, and others around the country have as well. And so one of the first things we did was to create uh, what we called the Yale Food Addiction Scale. And this was a way of, of looking in human populations uh, of criteria that you might think would be relevant if food is triggering some kind of an addictive process. So we took, the, we took addiction dependence related questions right out of the DSM for substance abuse, um, put, in, put them into a food context, and then the scale has been used in a lot of studies around the world now uh, to examine the whole issue of food and addiction. So that was strategic study number one. Uh, we also wrote a series of articles um, on, there were sort of editorial opinion type pieces about whether food can be addictive with Ashley taking the lead. And here's an example of one of those. Um, and then Ashley and, and colleagues have done a number of things, including this paper looking at neurocorrelates of food addiction. And so what I've shown you is, is just a, a, a small part of what we have done, which is in turn a very small part of the overall work that's been done on the food addiction uh, topic. But it starts to make you wonder whether food is hijacking the brain in some way and whether some public policy should follow from that. So in working with Mark Gold, who is the chairman of the uh, psychiatry department at the University of Florida and a bell, very well-known researcher in this area, we thought it would be worthwhile putting together a book, an edited book that brought together all the, the recent research and relevant research on the topic. And that's the connection with Oxford University Press, because just within the past few months, Oxford was nice enough to publish this edited book that we created uh, that brings together work from a variety of scholars around the world who do work on the biological aspects of this. Um, but also the social treatment aspects of it, and in addition to that, even some of the legal and policy implications that this topic of food and addiction might create. Now, by the way, I'm not so interested, although there are others who are, in the, the whole issue of whether individuals can be addicted to food enough that you would call them a food addict. Um, that, that's a very interesting potential group of people, and there are others who study that. But the, the public health implications of focusing on that group are pretty small because the group itself isn't likely to be that large. Um, and what I'm more interested in is what's happening to, to all the other people who may not have a big enough problem to consider themselves a food addict, but are having their food preferences and food patterns highly affected by what these foods are doing to the brain. So it could be the typical teenage child who gets off of school in the middle of the afternoon and thinks he or she needs to have a Coke or a Pepsi or a vitamin water, whatever it happens to be, but some type of sugar beverage. So that's why we wrote this book on food and addiction. And we're very proud of how this came out uh, because so many of the world's leading people who uh, study this topic agreed to write chapters for the book. And so the quality of the chapters in the book are really quite good. Uh, but this is another, another example of strategic research. Um, in this same context, I wanted to mention some work uh, that's gone on with sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, what used to be a very small number of products when I was a boy uh, has exploded. And so the sugared beverage aisles in the supermarkets are massive, and they contain whole new categories like energy drinks, um, um, sports drinks, sweetened teas, uh, fortified waters, and the like. Um, why care about these? Uh, why worry about these sugared beverages? And this, there are a whole list of reasons for that. And it's sure beverages have become, in some ways, public enemy number one in the nation's uh, fight to address obesity. 
uh, not because they're the only cause of, of obesity or diabetes, but because they're an important cause, and the science on it is so clear, um, and they're a very understandable category of food that doesn't have redeeming nutrition value because they're just completely empty calories. Uh, the other little-known fact that make these sugared beverages uh, so important is that the body doesn't seem to recognize or understand that it's eaten calories when they come delivered in liquids. Um, so you just don't feel as full. And the fact that people are consuming s such a high percentage of their calories in beverages compared to what used to be the case turns out to be a real problem. And then, of course, there's the in potential effective, uh, addictive effect of sugar and the gratuitous addition of a known substance that um, leads to addictive properties like withdrawal, um, and that's caffeine, of course. So there's a lot of focus on the sugared beverages, and so we've thought a lot about what role we might play and what kind of strategic research or scholarship might be helpful. And one of the things that we've done is think, think as others have, although this is not our work, about creating a scientific case by how these beverages lead to negative health outcomes. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go over this quickly, but there's the, the uh, citation there if any of you would like to look into this further. So one of the first things that we did was I wrote this paper with Tom Frieden, who at the time was the health commissioner of New York City, and he's now the, the director of the Centers for Disease Control in Washington. We wrote this paper making a public policy case for taxing sugar-sweetened beverages. And the idea here was that there, there are commonalities um, between uh, the nation's attempt to deal with tobacco, say, with high tobacco taxes and alcohol, too, and what might be happening with food. We followed it with another paper in the same journal um, with others, in this case the new health commissioner of New York City, Tom Farley, a number of other well-known people in the diet, nutrition, and also economic area. And here we made an economic case for doing it as well as a public health case. Now these, these two papers were not uh, research, but they were published in, in a well-known uh, journal and they were thought pieces that got people thinking about the idea of sugar-sweetened beverages. And they coincided with the economy going very bad and, and legislators beginning to talk about taxes as uh, one of the only means of repairing budget deficits in, in the states and the cities and also the national government. And so people began talking about soda taxes as a potential public health measure that would have two virtues. It could reduce health care costs because people would drink less soda and then also it would raise a lot of revenue. And if that were used for any health-related cause, and you can't count on government doing that, but if it were, then it would be an, another benefit. Um, it was important in this context to work out what's, what the economists know as elasticity of demand, trying to find out how much uh, consumption of sugared beverages would change if taxes of a certain amount were put in. And so Tanya Andreeva, who's the economist working at the Rudd Center uh, with me, uh, wrote a very interesting and important um, um, paper on both the elasticity and the, the revenue generating uh, potential. Um, we also then created on our own website, and you're welcome to view this if you'd like, you can go to our website and put in any state or major city in the country and it will generate uh, an estimate of how much revenue could be raised if a tax were put into place. And so it generates a table that looks like this. Um, I was just in Colorado giving a talk, so that's the state I happen to have up here. And um, the bottom line number is that if you did a tax of a penny per ounce on beverages with added sugar, you could raise almost uh, $200 million a year for the state. So it's a good bit of money, and the, this is something that the politicians will pay attention to. So the soda taxes have become an interesting um, venue for making changes. And the strategic scholarship that we've tried to do, um, I think, has been helpful in pushing that argument along. Um, if you look around the country, there are lots of attempts, lots of programs out there to reduce intake of sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, and just a few of them, uh, were, there's a lot of thought now to whether marketing can be reduced, especially to kids. There are a lot of science and news uh, alerts about new studies that come out. You may have heard recently about three papers that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed even further proof about the negative consequences of these beverages. Changes in schools all around the country kicking these things out. 
Um, there are cities like Boston where the, the mayor has declared that they're not going to be selling things on municipal properties that make people sick, and they've kicked out the sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, the Bloomberg portion size restriction would be an example of government's attempt to regulate the practices of the industry. Hospitals are going soda-free or sugar beverage-free around the country. Any of you work in hospitals, it's certainly worth bringing that up if your hospital hasn't done that. There are lots of educational campaigns in major cities around the country to discourage soda consumption. I would be surprised if litigation is not close by, um, and that's an interesting issue to talk about, but I won't go into it further. And then the idea of taxes. There are a lot of things going on here, and the question is how can the scientific community help? And if you're out there in your own community and you want to make a difference, what possible role might you play in this? Um, I'd like to end with what I think is a very interesting victory that brings together this issue of scholarship. And it's something called the Smart Choices Case Study. And then I'll end with this and then welcome any input or questions people have. Um, Smart Choices was a program that uh, the food industry launched in 2009. And essentially what it did was it got together with itself with some scientific input, but not a lot. Uh, and create a nutrition criteria, and then any product that met or exceeded those criteria could be awarded the Smart Choices label by the industry itself. Uh, there were a number of concerns as this program was taking shape. Uh, one is whether the industry would set weak and self-serving criteria so that it most of its unhealthy products would be considered a smart choice. And then the other is whether consumers would be confused by this symbol uh, believing that it was a government-related program that had some reasonable criteria underlying it. In fact, subsequent research showed that that, that was true, that the consumers were confused and didn't think that this was an industry-related program. So in 2009, a number of things happened, and one of the key players was um, the Attorney General in our own state, Richard Blumenthal. He's now in the U.S. Senate, but at the time was the Connecticut Attorney General. And uh, we got involved with him on this smart choices thing, and some interesting things happened. Uh, the criteria were so weak that these kind of products could be considered a smart choice and would earn that label. And so people thought this wasn't very credible, including the attorney general. And so over a very short period of time in 2009, a number of interesting things happened. One is that the New York Times found out about the, the smart choices program being released by the industry. And in September, September 4th, there was an article by Willie Newman of the New York Times that was very critical of the Smart Choices program. The Connecticut Attorney General on October 14th in 2009 launched an official investigation into the Smart Choices program. Uh, this was covered in newspapers around the country. Uh, the word got out that there were other AGs, attorneys general, who were behind the Connecticut one and ready to take action themselves depending on what happened in Connecticut. And the Connecticut Attorney General basically held the press conference and stood up with a box of Fruit Loops and said, should the citizens of, be, of Connecticut be told by the food industry that this is a smart choice? And he, he said, this might be deceptive and misleading, and I'm going to go after them. And he issued what were called demand letters, which were just sort of subpoenas to the industry, demanding to know who paid who to do this, uh, how the criteria were set up, et cetera. Um, and then word got out about that, as I mentioned, in a subsequent New York Times article. There was a phone call, an open phone call, about a week later from the commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration that was critical of the Smart Choices program. And on October 23, the industry closed it down. Uh, this was a really remarkable victory because it occurred so quickly. Um, and the reason that it occurred, at least in my mind, is the bad publicity that came from the Connecticut Attorney General investigation, but began before that with a New York Times article that obviously got syndicated in lots of places. Um, the industry could have fought this off in court. Uh, it's easy to, um, um, to just stall and stall in court, as you know, and the, the legal uh, actions by the Attorney General could have taken longer than the, the logical shelf life of this program for the industry. But it was bad publicity that they really couldn't tolerate. So this was a really an interesting victory. And there was some strategic scholarship on our part and the part of others to help the Attorney General by giving him information about how much food was being marketed to kids, what the impact was on their health and well-being, et cetera. And so here was an example of the scientific community interacting with the press and with the state's highest 
a law enforcement officer, the state attorney general, in order to close this down. And if, if all that had happened was a paper in a scientific journal, uh, the New York Times nor the Connecticut attorney general would have even known about this. And it wouldn't have gone too far. But in turn, we have this important victory that basically signals to industry that you better behave or somebody's going to watch you and get after you for it and expose you and make your life miserable in terms of the, the bad press that will rain down on you. And that has taught the industry I, what I think is an important lesson. Um, but it was all these parties working together that created that. So again, back to our original uh, diagram, this is what we hope to do as a Rudd Center by helping identify the important change agents using the last example, it was the press and the attorney general. That helps us develop questions that we can address with our scholarship. We communicate these things widely, particularly through the press. We hope that that in turn helps the change agents get done what they're hoping to accomplish and that ultimately can lead to social change. So I will end there and again um, let you know that most of what I've said today and a lot of additional information is available on our website. And I thank you for joining in and I'd be more than happy to answer questions. Okay, so um, I'm going to unmute everybody now. So uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. I have a question about the serial study that you did. Yes. Um, was any attempt made to control for personality factors and previous experience on the part of the children who were in the study? No. Uh, there was no, uh, we didn't really address personality factors at all. And it's possible we had some information on eating habits, previous eating habits, but I'd, I'd have to go back and, and look to be sure. But if, if you'd like, you could send me an email and I could send you the study, or it's available out there in general. It was published in Pediatrics, as I said. Okay. That's a good question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Um, what advice might you have for a, a scientist more junior than yourself in terms of getting funding for strategic science like you're advocating here? Well, we're, we're blessed in, in having some funding that supports the, the strategic research in our center. Mm -hmm. And the young scientists who are working with us are fortunate to have some of mm -hmm. that funded. Um, for the most part, um, there's not a lot of funding for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, although the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is doing some funding, very interesting funding for work on childhood obesity, and they would be one possible place to look. And also, NIH itself is getting more interested in policy-related research. Um, that's been pretty slow in coming, but there have been some advances there, so that might be a possibility as well. One question is whether um, people early in their careers can afford to do this kind of thing if the field is expecting them to do a different set of activities that lead to promotion and, and high regard in the field. Um, we try to walk, with my graduate students especially, we try to walk a very thin line there between having work that is both strategically important um, but also is scientifically meaningful. And so the work that I mentioned from Ashley Gearhart on the food addiction area is an example of that. She was doing new work that hadn't been done. But it was a very intellectually rich area. And she did good studies and published them in good journals. And as a consequence, got a, a really good job. But if all she did was this strategic research, that probably mm -hmm. wouldn't have been the case. And so doing a combination of things is, is important. Some of these strategic studies, by the way, cost almost nothing and can be done very quickly. Um, one of my other graduate students who's now at Harvard, Christina Roberto, uh, did a very interesting study um, on menu labeling when New York City and other places were wanting to put in regulations to require restaurants to label calories on the menus. One of the things that some places, California in particular, were wanting to do at the request of the industry was to exempt drive-in windows from the requirement. And when we heard about this, we did a study, Christina did a study, um, that 
took about just a few weeks to do, actually, and got mobilized very quickly and cost almost nothing because we simply had Yale undergraduates and, and some other observers go to restaurants and just observe how many people went through the drive-in window versus walked into the restaurant. It turned out about 60% of people were getting their food from the drive-in window. And so to have a law that would, that would overlook 60% of the customers wouldn't make any sense. And that little study that cost almost nothing made a diff big difference in legislative considerations around the country when, when, the, when the industry went looking to have that exemption. And then legislators were told, well, I'll miss 60% of people, and then they didn't go for the exemption. Um, so overall, I think there is a fine line that, that one can walk, but you're obviously more free to do these kind of things as you get later in a career and more established. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Kelly? I wondered what I, what your next uh, line of research will be. Well, we're doing, uh, we're continuing a lot of work on the food and addiction area. Uh, we're continuing a lot of work on taxes. And probably the area, our, our single biggest uh, set of projects is on the issue of food marketing directed at children. And we did those reports that I mentioned on fast food, on cereal, and on sugared beverages. And now our marketing team, which is led by Jennifer Harris, uh, are doing other studies, some of them smaller, looking at the impacts of the marketing, not just documenting the amount of it and what's being marketed, but the, the specific impacts. And there's a lot of interest these days on the cognitive abilities of children and at what age do they realize they're marketed to and um, what of, and the, the impact of um, approaches used by the industry to, to intentionally thwart people's um, resistance to marketing, like product placements in television shows and movies would be an example. So people may not even recognize that there's marketing going on when there is. So that's an, that's an area that our marketing team is looking at. So I would say that's one big area of future focus for us. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? OK, well, um, I just want to let everybody know that I will be sending out a um, follow-up email um, shortly after the webinar. And included in there is going to be a link to an online survey. So um, it'd be really great if you could just hop on and let us know what you thought of the presentation, and it'll help us um, shape our webinars going forward. Um, attached will also try to provide um, some more information. So I'll discuss with Kelly, and maybe we can send some links to some of the studies discussed, or um, possibly like a PDF of the uh, PowerPoint slides. Um, so once again, I just want to thank everyone for attending today and for sharing your good thoughts. And a big thanks to Kelly for presenting for us. All right, thanks to the folks who joined us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.